I'd now like to introduce Professor Belinda Gabay, Head of the Pre-Hospital and Emergency and Trauma Research Unit, who will then hand over to Dr. Darshini Aiton. Both of them are from the Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. Please welcome Belinda. Very tough act to follow after what we've heard so far. And really I've been asked to speak about the sort of key findings that we found when we interrogated some databases that we hold in Victoria. And some of these databases are uniquely Victorian. So we had an opportunity to do something we've never been able to do before. Um, but I really need to thank Dr. Janneke Bereki Gisov and Dr. Jane Heyman from the Monash University Accident Research Centre and also Dr Sandra Braff um, from the Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine who also made this possible. So really we were looking at the data that we hold in Victoria. We were looking for population data sets and I'm pressing the big button with the little arrow in the middle of it and nothing is happening. <laughs> Could I have the next slide? I press it really hard. Oh, got one. Right, so really, oh no, actually I need to go back one now. Sometimes it's just so much nicer to be able to touch the computer and there we go. So really in injury research, we talk about something called an injury pyramid. With the base of the pyramid, the most common types of injuries or most frequent injuries, but the least severe. And the apex of that pyramid being the most severe, which we um, consider death. And really, Unfortunately, despite them being the, large, the largest group of, of family violence and related injury, we have very little information from the bottom of that pyramid. So the people who self-treat or don't seek treatment in any way and those who um, attend primary care, we have very little information about. The focus of the research that we did within this report is really focused on the people that presented to emergency departments in Victoria through the VEND, which is really which collects um, quite detailed injury data on anybody who comes to a public and most private emergency departments in the state. And the hospital admissions related to family violence, which is the VAED. And we also had um, quite significant data from a population-based trauma registry called the Victorian State Trauma Registry. And within that registry, we also follow up patients out to two years after injury. And we also have a nested study where we have been following people out to five years after injury and doing some quite detailed longitudinal qualitative research. So I just mentioned the data sets, the detail will be in the reports, but we had some challenges identifying family violence people within the reports because with the admissions data, we're very reliant on the classification coding that the hospitalised, the hospital data, um, the hospitalisations are collected with. Um, so we rely on the presence of codes that are not particularly intuitive or specific and really lack the detail in what we actually want to know about the, the family of violence event. With the emergency department presentations, we get a text narrative, so a little story that um, tells us what happened to the person. And with the hospitalised major trauma, we get the ICD coding, so the hospital coding. We get a text narrative of the story and we also get another code that we can cross um, check across each of the sources to get a better understanding of what actually happened to the person. So these data sets really formed the basis of what we were looking at and I'm just going to pick up some of the key findings for you. So really across the population in the 10 years that we did the study we would expect nearly 20 people per 100,000 to vis visit an emergency department for a family violence related injury. We would expect a nearly 10 to come to, to be admitted to hospital each year per 100,000. And fortunately, the major trauma patients are the most severe of the injury patients. Um, and then we expect about 0.4 per 100,000. And that's what we observed in the data. Now, that doesn't mean anything. What we were able to see is in that 10 year time frame, we had um, nearly 11,000 emergency department presentations for family violence alone. Uh, over 5,000 hospital admissions and 203 people who sustained really severe, very, very severe major trauma in that time frame. And we can see across the data sets that the prevalence of head injury actually increased with the severity and it represents how important um, getting treatment for uh, TBI or head injury actually is. So in our major trauma patients, more than, 50, more than half, 57% had sustained a head injury. 
54% of the emergency of, of the admissions to hospital had sustained a head injury and one in three ED presentations had sustained a head injury from the family violence group. Across the lifespan, we saw quite differences um, in the presentations and also in the perpetration of family violence. In our children, it was nearly always an assault by a person, a blunt assault, often not involving an object. Um, it was predominantly the parent or it was unknown. And the reason it's unknown is because it's often incredibly difficult to determine. Many of the text narratives would say something like um, injuries um, consistent with non-accidental injury, but they don't have a clear picture. Um, they're not getting this, the story from the family members that don't exactly know what's actually happened. So for quite a large proportion of the cases, we don't know who inflicted the violence on the child. In children, we see a much more even gender distribution, both boys and girls. But as we move through the lifespan and we get into these sort of um, emerging adults, 15 to 24 year olds, we see the rise of cutting and piercing objects, predominantly kitchen knives, scissors, screwdrivers, various other things that you'll find around the house. And almost exclusively at the cause of the, or the perpetrator of the violence is an intimate partner. Again, as we move through to 25 to 64 year olds, again, this real rise of cutting and piercing objects. So a lot of kitchen knives, assault by a person or an object and the introduction of objects into the assault here are nearly always um, in most circumstances an intimate partner. It changes a little bit in the 65 and over. So once we get into the old adults, we're really dealing with similar causes, but we see falls coming up here. So family violence causing falls. Um, and a lot of the time now we're seeing a change from intimate partners to actually the ch children of the older adult um, perpetrating that violence. And in our major trauma patients, more than 50% of the, of the family violence cases in people over the age of 65 were actually caused by their child. And most cases, I think it was roughly about 80%, it was the son. So the other things that we found out through the data sets and through the analyses that we could do were there were very different path, patient pathways for family violence related major trauma cases. And here some of the concerning things that we saw were despite higher or equivalent severity with other types of unintentional accidental injury, their length of stay in hospital was profoundly shorter. And also they had a much lower rate of, of um, discharge to inpatient rehabilitation. So they're leaving the hospital in a shorter time frame and not having the same access to inpatient rehabilitation that the other major trauma patients are having. And you can see that they're having a very abbreviated time in the specialist trauma centres. So dealing with the issues of being a severe injury and family violence related is probably not going to get the attention that it needs. We found that our family violence cases had profoundly poor long-term outcomes out to two years when compared to unintentional injury. And most of that was driven by much higher rates of pain, persistent pain and anxiety and depression. And subsequent to that, poorer quality of life, poorer return to work rates and also poor overall function. We conservatively estimated, and Janneke and I would say this is a very conservative and largely underestimated on the basis of the data that we had that 61, there'll be 61 new cases of family violence related brain injury every year in Victoria that will go on to significant permanent disability and it's 61 cases too many. What we also found is through the qualitative interviews we've been doing with patients and these are in-depth interviews either with the person who'd sustained the traumatic brain injury, their carer or family member that there's this profound lack of recognition in the systems about how complex the circumstances actually are and really profound difficulties in getting access to services for pers persistent pain, mental health, and just really getting the support in their house, the separation, um, the legal issues that arise and having those dealt with becomes really quite difficult. And there's this, con this overwhelming sense of disempowerment that comes from dealing with the organisations and multiple organisations. So some of the challenges and recommendations that came out of working with the data were that we had a lot of trouble. My slides look very different to the ones I sent through, so it's quite fun. Um, <laughs> the identification of family violence cases, we're very reliant on classifications, that, including the ICD, which is the way the hospitals classify all of the cases that come through. Very, very limited ICD codes, very difficult to identify the perpetrator and often just bundling together, say, other family member when we need to know the detail for prevention purposes. The text narratives can be either be very detailed or very useless, like 
um, injuries not consistent with accidental injury, not really helpful in any way. And we also have a lot of trouble actually um, identifying the sex of the perpetrator. We really needed that to be in the text narrative and that often wasn't the case. And as I said, those text narratives in the, ch in the, ch in the children's cases were really, really difficult to read. The classification of head injury can become quite challenging, so the ICD-10 AM coding system doesn't really have an inbuilt severity score. The major trauma registry has a much better version, but it's not consistent across the data sets. We had a lot of trouble identifying specific mechanisms that people were interested in. So, for example, there's a single code for strangulation, suffocation and hanging, and we couldn't actually separate <coughs> out any of those. And these were standalone data sets. In the time frame we had available, we actually couldn't link them together. We couldn't look at repeat presentations. We couldn't look at the patterns of presentations over time, which we think will be really important moving into the future. And just to thank the funders for the project and also for the registries as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so today I'm just going to present briefly on the findings from um, my component of the research, which we've done under the lead of um, Professor Belinda Gabe. Um, and this included a rapid review of the academic literature. So basically, we in that five month time period sourced 65 relevant articles in relation to brain injury and family violence, which represented the studies that were being done across the world. And we also conducted interviews and focus groups with practitioners. So these are people who are working in the sectors of health, justice and family violence. This component of the research and what I'm going to present to you today is specifically focusing on addressing the questions, what are the contributing factors um, to brain injury within the context of family violence? And also what are the knowledge and service gaps in relation to brain injury within the context of family violence? <laughs> Oh yeah, okay, stay on this slide. Um, so our research can really be summarised by this model. So this is the model that I created with my co-researcher, Dr Elizabeth Pritchard. Um, it's, we've called it the Brain Injury and Family Violence Nexus and it brings together what has been in the literature, the academic literature and also the findings from our interviews. So I'm just going to briefly talk you through it. Um, the model is positioned within the overarching influences of cultural and societal factors, so beliefs, values and attitudes, particularly towards family violence, but also legislation and policy. So they kind of, we kind of call this a hamburger model, but they kind of sandwich that, what, everything else that's happening. On the left side of the model, we see contributing factors to brain injury. So um, this includes assault, can include family violence, but also other criminal acts, so pub brawls, those types of violence, um, transport crashes, injuries from sport, and also involvement in the military. A lot of the research was from the US, so it picked up on a lot of the military research. So for example, an individual may be in a transport crash. They may obtain a brain injury from that transport crash, which may lead them to either be a victim or a perpetrator of family violence. If we go to the right side of the model, you'll see the contributing factors influencing family violence, and this was predominantly identified through the literature. These included biological factors, um, so such as being a male aged under two, um, being a twin, premature birth, having congenital abnormalities, being pregnant, and being female. The relationship factor um, captures the relationship between the victim and perpetrator. Um, so intimate partner, father or partner of the mother, uh, sons that we've heard of recently, and also siblings. Another factor was previous experience of family violence, and this included both being um, receiving family violence but also observing family violence. And then our last factor are what we've called stresses or life stresses, and this includes financial stresses, employment, housing, natural disasters, and also living in a conflict zone. So a victim may enter the right side of the model via life stresses, which may lead to family violence, which may lead to a brain injury through these events. The perpetrator may have and the literature and our research um, said this quite a lot, may have experienced family violence as a child, either receiving it or observing it. Um, 
and experience a brain injury through that pathway, but then also go on to perpetrate family violence. The model also illustrates the complexity of untangling the indicators of brain injury. And so when we say indicators, we mean things, it's not a diagnosis, but might be flags for a brain injury, loss of consciousness, memory problems, decreased decision-making capacity, headaches, sleeping problems. Um, having those indicators and trying to untangle that from um, post-traumatic stress symptoms, mental health disorders, um, substance abuse. So even for practitioners in our study who were able to identify these indicators of brain injury, many reported that they didn't feel like they'd spent enough time with their clients or their patients um, to actually recognise or identify these symptoms in the individual. Practitioners in our study also described a lack of knowledge or awareness of brain injury in the context of family violence. So just this quote here, I think knowledge of brain injury is a huge gap. I've worked with a lot of women who've had facial injuries and head injuries, but I've understood it as broken bones that may be repaired. I never thought of it, is there a brain injury there? So I think number one is knowledge of brain injury and how it occurs, and then knowledge of good partnerships with services that can work towards diagnosis and follow-up care. So a number of our participants who were working in the family violence sector recognised that it was not their role to diagnose the brain injury, and they acknowledged that they needed to be aware of appropriate referral pathways, yet even when there was knowledge of referral pathways, there was a recognition that the waiting list for assessments were really long. So when we put in to get a neuropsych ABI assessment, the wait list was like 18 months or something. One participant reported that even when referrals to follow-up care services for brain injury were provided, the uptake of these referrals by um, individuals experiencing family violence was poor. Having a brain injury and de dealing with the complexity of family violence and any other issues that may be going on in their life can make following diagnostic processes and accessing support services difficult, and that's reflected in this quote. We found often that they had a lot of complex health needs, so their acquired brain injury was part of other issues that they had with mental health, with substance abuse, housing and homelessness. Um, other participants um, identified a number of challenges. So, for example, the client's inability to remember appointments. Difficulty with problem solving, working out how do I attend this appointment um, on time, on the correct date. Financial constraints, in particular travel costs. The distance from home, so even travelling 45 minutes can be quite challenging. For rural areas, travelling hours can be incredibly challenging. Um, ability to provide childcare, school drop-offs and navigate that around appointment times. Lack of choice of appointment times. Lack of understanding of what the appointments were actually for. The need to attend all appointments necessary for diagnosis and intervention, not just one repeat abuse or injury which may then prevent them from attending, needing a support person, difficulty in navigating the health system, threats from the perpetrator, the family and also the community about being proven that they may not be able to cope with raising their children. Participants in our study felt that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups and migrant populations in particular faced more barriers to accessing support and help, which led to staying in a family violence situation more likely, which then again increases their chances of obtaining a brain injury. Um, for example, women on a spousal visa are completely reliant on their husband for food, housing, healthcare and finances. This situation makes asking for help quite complicated. A protection visa can take 12 to 18 months to process. Hence, they tend to stay with their husband because they're fearful of what could happen to them and their children if they leave the marriage. And this is illustrated in this quote here. Fear of being deported, fear that their children will be taken away from them, fear that they won't be able to support themselves, and that comes to the whole financial issue. One of the participants highlighted challenges of prisoners accessing medical and support services for brain injury post-release. And this is really important in relation to prevention efforts um, of family violence and also to provide follow-up care. For example, the NDIS specifically excludes prisoners and therefore funding cannot be applied for while a prisoner is in prison. Um, so this quote, the lack of safe, affordable housing and navigating a system like 
that when you have an acquired brain injury is even more difficult and the huge bureaucracy of to find yourself a way, your way around. I think there needs to be better joined up kinds of justice health initiatives. I think there needs to be people like nurses and other health professionals and disability support workers in police stations, in courthouses, in prisons. There needs to be better access to those. And this quote really reflects the sentiment across the care continuum, across the sectors. Um, one model that was highlighted as working quite well in some regional and rural areas was inter-service collaboration. The services work together with the family to ensure that the whole family is supported. Participants highlighted that the effectiveness of formal collaboration, but also the informal collaborations that had developed in these regions due to working together for such a long period of time. There is much more I would love to share with you, um, but in the interest of time, I cannot. But this is a snapshot. I encourage you to read the report and also be in contact with me if you have any questions. Thank you.